Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Coco and Dalts, another special summertime episode. Last year... What? I know, last year we went like six months without recording any episodes. We were in the uh, French Riviera doing research. We were, we went to Cannes, we scoped out all the hotels and boats that people party on and... I appreciate the fact that you didn't say Cannes. (laughs) <laughs> no, I have cans. I don't go to cans. <laughs> For those of you watching in the video portion will attest to that. Fact. So I'm not Dolts. Oh, and I'm still not Coco. And today, this special episode is all about the brand new Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which we just got home from in the past hour. And we're going to review for you because we know that you are on the edges of your seats wondering what our takes are. You know what? I think you had listener at cans. <laughs> They're in. They're, They're in. hooked. <laughs> They're all about it. So before we give you our hot takes, Daltz is going to give you a plot summary okay, of so a three hour long movie. Thank you for that introduction, Coco. <laughs> you bet. Um, you can't tell that we rehearsed this earlier, can you? The... Uh, So the movie is Quentin Tarantino directed movie, produced, written, as he usually does, starring none other than Leonardo DiCaprio as an actor who is on his way down on the downswing in 1969. His career is not doing so well. His sidekick is none other than Brad Pitt, who is his former stuntman guy who, you know, double that kind of thing. Kind of just turned into like a gopher. Right. Drives him around, fixes his TV antenna when it falls down. Rick Dalton. uh, So let's just get this, you know, address the (laughs) elephant in the room right now. Not me, even though somebody might call me Daltz. I have been known to be called Daltz, even though I'm not Coco. Much better than, um, better looking than Leo. Well, you're supposed to say that, but thank you and not true. Um, So the plot therein uh, develops from there in terms of Leonardo DiCaprio's character, who is uh, Rick Dalton, as I mentioned. He is trying to get some work and there's a plot in that's sort of one of the plots. The other plot is Brad Pitt is just kind of meandering and taking his shirt off while fixing antennae on the roof. I did enjoy that scene. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. And uh, then there's also like a subplot about the Manson family because Sharon Tate lives next door to Rick Dalton in Hollywood. Um, And by the way, Rick Dalton is fictitious. He's not a real character. He's sort of an amalgam of many other characters from TV lore and, and Hollywood lore. And there, uh, from there it goes the plot. It develops from there. It's, it's not really a buddy movie. It's not really a mystery. It's not really anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, good segue. Tell me what you thought of the movie, Dolls. No, I've been doing the talking on the summary, so now no. it's your turn to tell me. Because I'm... So, listener, we did not talk about this. We consciously, after the movie was over, we looked at each other. And then we didn't say anything. And then I was like, no, don't say anything. Save it for the podcast. Well, you did say that you told your mom not to go see the movie. Okay. Yeah, but that's my but, mom. Yeah. My mom's 82 years old and listening. Thank you for downloading, mom. Yeah, I... Uh... So what do you, what do you think? <laughs> Give me your unvarnished I, opinion. I, I feel I'm like... I'm not going to change my... No, no, no. I feel like regardless of what you and I think about the movie, it is not the kind of movie that your mom would enjoy. <laughs> Just like it's not the kind of movie that my dad would enjoy. Right. When in like 1995, I took my dad to go see Pulp Fiction and 20 minutes in, he gave me this like really evil sideways glance and... I was like, oh, crap, this was a mistake. And then as soon as the lights came up, he was like, that's three hours of my life. I'll never go back. So (laughs) So I had a moment. So as a segue, I had a moment, not a segue, a tangent. I had uh, a similar uh, experience with an ex-girlfriend. I took, uh, uh, we rented a movie to watch with her parents. This was like the first weekend I met them. And this was back when you rented movies on VHS. Ooh, and like I went from Blockbuster? From Blockbuster. Oh, it was the yeah. uh, Canadian equivalent to Blockbuster, which I think was Video 99. Awesome. Uh, not owned by Wayne Gretzky. I don't know why the 99 was in there, but anyway. WTF. So uh, we go to the movie uh, to rent this. I was like, oh, I'd heard a lot of good things about this movie. So I grabbed this movie and said, let's watch this with your parents. Okay, sounds good. Very religious, very church-going people. We get home. Of course, the movie is, guess what the movie could be? 
Deep throat? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why'd you go there? <laughs> well, you said religious think, and church of, going. Think so. of like uh, a movie of great renown, a director, violent, and also sweary. I, I don't know. What? So the movie was Goodfellas. Awesome. And I read later on that it has the most <laughs> F-bombs in any mainstream movie. So this is the movie that I selected to impress my girlfriend-in-law. I don't know what what you would call them. Girlfriend's parents, I guess. Yeah. So needless to say, I'm not with her anymore. I'm, you know, <laughs> How long did that last? Not long after that, actually. <laughs> That was the one and only weekend you were together. <laughs> yeah, we didn't, I didn't rent movies after that. <laughs> so um, reverse the, from the tangent yes. and carry on, Coco. I, I liked it. I didn't love it. I would give it maybe a C-ish. Um, I, I thought Brad Pitt did a good job, yeah. not just because we are both from Missouri. I was going to say, I really like people from Missouri, so yeah. I, like, I always like him. Uh, even though Leo was supposed to be from Missouri in the, in the movie, in the movie yeah. but you know, from Southern Missouri, clearly given his accent. Right. Um, I, not from Baldwin, which I, no. where I used to live. Yeah, suburban St. Louis. Yeah. Um, he, I, I, Leo did an okay job. Like yeah. There were a few times when I could see him acting, yeah. which you know was um, what it was. Of of, I, and then you've got the lady playing Sharon Tate, Margot Robbie or Robbie. Yep. I don't know exactly how you say her last name. From I Tonya fame, who was great in I Tonya. Also good in The Wolf of Wall Street. Right, surprisingly. Right. Um, I alongside just, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, yep. she she wasn't given a whole lot to do. She and was. She just looked good. She was she, eye candy, which she, I think is kind of below her. She's she can really act. And honestly, I felt as though there were a lot of problems with the movie. Um, which, <laughs> let's get into them because yeah, I think I agree that. with that. Um, yeah, you know, race and gender wise, there were a lot of problems with the movie. And I didn't think that she was depicted extremely well. Mm -hmm. She was very kind of eager to be impressed with herself right. and kind of fame hoary. Like right. there's a scene where she goes to a theater where one of her movies is playing and she tries to get into the movie for free by right. specifically telling them, I'm the girl in the movie. That's me. And then she's in the movie, and every time she's on the screen and people are laughing or whatever, she's kind of beaming and looking around. And she was just very not depicted well. I, it was a different sort of depiction than, you know, she's like the young, eager, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, Hollywood person and like Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt are like the beaten down and broken right. middle-aged right. Hollywood people. So there is that juxtaposition. Like Leonardo DiCaprio still wants to be loved and stuff. Like he's still kind of desperate and grasping and she's like kind of the flip side of that coin. And, you know, and I, I'm not trying to speak ill of somebody who ended up being brutally murdered, you know, because yeah. I don't know what she was like as a person. I don't know anything right. about her other than the fact that she was killed by the Manson family. Right. Which, and I don't think a lot of people know a lot about her either. Which in the movie, she wasn't killed by the Manson family. And can I just say that I don't really like movies that have an alternative to facts ending. But it's it's a movie, though. I mean, it's, it's a movie, it's fiction. I, I it's just, not a documentary. I mean, I didn't want to see her get killed or anything, but I was just like, but that's not how it actually happened in reality. Yeah. So. I, don't, I don't mind that because I think there's a lot of liberties taken with movies. Like you look at all the Oliver Stone movies that were made. They were entertaining. They weren't factually based. They're not journalists. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't mind that as much. What I minded about this was at, at a very... Oh, there's my stomach growling. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, what I what I didn't like about this movie, and there were a lot of things I did not like about this movie, um, <laughs> was I wasn't sure what it was about. Yeah, definitely. Like I... There were a lot of tangents going on. There were a lot of... Uh, Bees flying around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> They're, uh, it, um, we'll edit that part out. The, uh, I, I like it. It's charming. Let's keep it in. The bee stinging me on yeah. the, uh, on the nose. Um, so I, I'm, I'm still not sure what the movie is about. It was, it, a, it was, I know Quentin Tarantino loves Hollywood. He has mm -hmm. an affection for Hollywood. That's well documented. I thought Pulp Fiction was one of the best movies of the 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the, the way that he played with the storyline in that movie, how the beginning and the end, and then wait a minute, this guy's dead. Why is he back in the movie? Mm -hmm. Uh, that whole thing that, 
he really revolutionized the movie. Uh, Zed's dead, story. baby. Right, and and actually a Bruce Willis character that was likable. Uh, re- <laughs> John re- McClane is so likable. Be quiet about the best <laughs> Christmas movie of all time. I was just saying that to get a rise out of you. But okay. there's also, he salvaged John uh, Travolta's career. Right. Uh, introduced us to Samuel Jackson. Like, Thank you, Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, that's, a, that's uh, so... Lots of laurels there for Quentin Tarantino in those days. Reservoir Dogs was not my favorite movie. Uh, it was kind of gross and gory and over the top. The dialogue was fantastic. Everything else was was excessive. And then Kill Bill was sort of like a reverse revert. I'm going out of order here. Kill Bill was after uh, Pulp Fiction, which was after Reservoir Dogs. But Kill Bill was more of a Reservoir Dog type movie with a lot of gore and stuff like that. This movie... I was waiting for the gore. I was waiting for the gore. Yeah, we it got took it. a long time to get there, but we got it. And oh did, my we God, did we ever get, get it? it? <laughs> did we ever get it? So that's one of the reasons, Mum, that I recommend you not see this movie because it's very gory in for about ten minutes. Yeah, it's a very graphic, gory scene. Uh, maybe, maybe more than that. Maybe a little bit more than that. But I, again, I'm not sure. Was it a was it a, a love letter to Hollywood? Yes, I think it was a love letter to Hollywood. But it was a love letter to more like. Like TV Hollywood, it wasn't yeah. love letter to the cinema. It so, but it was a little bit because of the Sharon Tate stuff. Like that was that it, was to the cinema. It was kind of like make Hollywood great again. <laughs> like that's great. Yeah. Tarantino has turned into like he started off, you know, twenty five years ago, like the brash, edgy. young, yep. edgy, yep. you know, auteur, and now he's the. He's been in the business for a while. You know, he's middle-aged himself. He's seen a lot. He's done a lot. He's gone to a lot of Hollywood parties. That's what's happened. Right. And now he's the middle-aged jaded one. And the movie was kind of like, you know, Rick Dalton is not able now to get anything other than guesting spots on these TV shows of all these up and coming actors. He's the villain that the hero beats up. Right. And like one of the directors doesn't even want him to be recognizable. So he puts like this goofy mustache on him and like this weave and he's got like, you know, a hat and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, and it was, so Rick Dalton is being usurped like professionally by young actors, but then, it's also the counterculture, like the culture is changing and like they're constantly decrying like all these damn hippies right. all over the place. And I don't think it was accidental that the hippies in question are the Manson family who <laughs> like metaphorically and figuratively killed the establishment. Right. But, and also represent the very worst of that generation's movement. Like there was right. a lot of good things yeah. that came out of the uh-huh. out of the hippie quote and, unquote hippie generation. Right. And you choose Peace, love and understanding. And you choose the Manson family to represent, to represent them. Yeah. So I I very much got whiffs of Make Hollywood Great Again from yeah. this movie. I, I think that it's you hit the nail on the head too about Tarantino being so mainstream now like this is very much I see this almost in the same way that it happened with Spielberg and it happened with Scorsese as they started off with these uh, especially Scorsese making these gritty sort of out of the box non-Hollywood kind of movies Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they take off and then and then uh Spielberg makes Schindler's List. You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden he's making the most Hollywood movie of all time. Right. And the same thing with Scorsese doing the same thing and, and working with all these actors that that he couldn't have sniffed before. Mm-hmm. And he was working with all these underground like uh, Scorsese with Robert De Niro and and, and mm-hmm. some guy like uh, Harvey Cartel, Cartel mm-hmm. like these actors that were really up and coming at the time and then he turned them into big stars. Uh, I see that happening now. The same thing with, happened with Quentin Tarantino. He's... He's made a Hollywood movie. I mean, it's got Hollywood in the title. Right. It's very much pandering to Hollywood. And he's got Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt starring in it. They couldn't be right. the two most and it, it ultimate was, box office guys that you could get in, in the movie. And it was extremely star-studded, too. Like, even the minor roles. Like, Kurt Russell showed up. Luke right. Perry showed up. I was like, oh, my God, yeah, poor Luke, Luke Perry. Perry. Al Pacino. Al Pacino was in it. Um, who played Al Pacino. And was, was, he played a Jewish Al Pacino. Yeah. And was it he like... He did the hand clap thing. when he first The first scene, I don't know. Like, he always does that hand yeah, clap yeah, thing. Uh-huh. He, he did it, the same thing again. And was it... Who was the guy who played Sharon Tate's... Uh, bestie like was that like Emil Hirsch 
Yeah. 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 Like, you know, he's in it, like yeah. a little more of like an indie guy or whatever. But yeah, I mean, like from top to bottom, like there were like... A, well, and there Rumor, was like, uh, Willis Rumor Willis was, was in, in this. Lena Dunham. Right. Um, there were a lot of who's who in this. And it was, it was just, it was like... It was a Leon. It was a it was a movie that Quentin Tarantino, I think, probably always wanted to make, um, but at the same time, probably was parodying when he was younger. Yeah, yeah, totally. Es- especially because, like, when they were at the ranch, when Brad Pitt was at the movie ranch where he had worked when he was younger, but now it's like the Manson family hideout. Right. And there was like the young guy on the horse. With like the flowing hair, the Tex. character's name is Tex, yeah. right? And I definitely got shades of like kind of a callback. There were a couple callbacks actually to earlier in Brad Pitt's career, like that callback to uh, Legends of the Fall, like because Brad Pitt's got the flowing hair and right. he's on the horse, right? You know, and stuff. And, and Thelma and Louise too. And Thelma and Louise, yeah. like when he was on Leo's roof and he took his shirt yeah. off and he's yeah. standing there like with the beer, and I'm like, that's Thelma and Louise. He's on the bed with well, Gina I Davis. Think, and I think the, the, the whole movie and, yeah. is an homage to Hollywood. Yeah. And, yeah. In, in various uh-huh. degrees, not just and, 1969, which is right. when it takes place, but there's all these references throughout the movie. And I thought that the, it just seemed to me like it was, he had too much money and nobody to say no yeah. in his ear. Because and, he had all these all these great cars, all mm-hmm. the radio commercials from the 60s, all mm-hmm. the TV commercials, all the, all the, like this, the NBC chime on TV and the black and white TVs, like all mm-hmm. these cultural references were put in there and they weren't like they were in pulp fiction where they they seem to stick out a little bit more there in, mm-hmm. in a good way it was very seamless like the integration of but it was it seemed fabricated to me it seemed like it was like going through a museum oh okay you know what i mean like uh-huh. it, it seemed like the set was just littered with all these things and all these mm-hmm. great cars and all these all these you know these these billboards and these radio commercials like i said it, it just seemed like it was just way too artificial it didn't seem mm-hmm. like it was like hey look how much research we've done look how much money we spent on props here it all is around here because there was a lot of very ponderous scenes in this movie where you would the scene would last a long time and it would yeah. be there would be nothing happening oh there's brad pitt <laughs> sitting in the car oh there he is still sitting in the car and now he's got his arm out the window from the same <laughs> angle it's like where yeah. is something gonna happen here yeah it, it, yeah I, I i don't i don't disagree it was very very long and kind of plotting and and directionless i mean yeah directionless maybe i shouldn't say that about a a director like quentin tarantino but it just didn't seem to it seemed to meander all over the place it needed good editing and it needed needed to be shortened by about half an hour yeah yeah i can i can buy that and once again it's a tarantino movie so like i said earlier it's got problems with race and gender so that even contributes even more to now the make hollywood great again vibe like you've got white guys throwing around racial slurs and you've got ladies who are just props even though the murder of one of them is kind of like the fuel of the whole story you know like like his wife at the end she's just kind of it there was like another kind of theme of like white guys refusing to grow up right like because leo kind of didn't you know and he was he was like a cry baby like every, yeah, he everything was, he did he was he yeah. dis- every disappointment he had and maybe that's hollywood i don't know but yeah it seemed like everything that ha- didn't go his way he cried about yeah and so like at the end he marries this italian actress and she just basically kind of served to be just like a caricature of a woman well, she's just like, a shrieking damsel yeah, in distress yeah and now okay well now like oh his, his career is on like, he made this big point of saying earlier, like, the reason he was living next door to Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski is because he made, like, a really good real estate investment early in his career when he had a lot of money. And he's like, no, when you have the money, you buy in Hollywood because this is, like, I'm putting down roots. I live here. I'm not, you know, coming from somewhere else and leaving. Like, I'm here in Hollywood. But then at the end, he marries this lady. And now all of a sudden... He can't live in Hollywood anymore. Like now he's got this dependent he has to support. So right. he's got to sell the house and they've got to move to like some crummy apartment like out in the valley. I'm yeah. like, what? What? How is that? Like, how is she going to fit all this luggage in an apartment in the valley? <laughs> like, I don't understand why now you have to sell this house. Like, yeah. I don't understand. So I think that, very. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead no, no, no. I, yeah. It was. Yeah. I was eager to say that uh, the overall theme for me was almost. So there are several opportunities in the, several uh, occasions, several instances, several scenes in the movie 
where something almost happens. Yeah. So there's one scene where uh, Brad Pitt, it's, it's actually a protracted scene where he's trying to get in the, when he's in the Hollywood ranch, the film ranch or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. He's trying to get up to see his buddy George or uh-huh. Fred yeah, or whatever yeah. his name was. And there's this whole protracted scene to try to get to see him. And where the suspense is building, the suspense is building because you think that George is is a rotting corpse in bed, right? Totally. <laughs> and there's this, and I, you know, this is a spoiler alert, but it's not really, it's not really any big deal. But you get to him, and then George is just a miserable old guy who's actually in bed. He's not mm-hmm. a rotting corpse. Yeah. So, and there's a couple of other scenes like that where you think something is going to happen, and then no, actually the car drives away before Tex comes with the horse. Yeah. And then there's this other scene where this happens, and it's it's it's. Perhaps intentional because Leonardo DiCaprio's character is almost famous again, right? Yeah. He's almost mm-hmm. a big deal. He's almost as so. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but there are several of those th- scenes that are contrary to how usually things work in Hollywood on a movie. Like usually in that scene, like I said, George would be a rotting corpse in bed, and Brad Pitt would turn around, and then all the Manson kids would come in with knives or something like that. Like yeah. something that you would expect to happen, some kind mm-hmm. of cliche, and those things don't happen. So. If that was intentional, I like it. Um, but maybe it was just a happy accident all the way through the movie. Yeah. And the and the way the scene and the way the, you know, he uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is next door to where the Tate murder takes place. Mm-hmm. So he's almost involved in the murder, right. or is he? As as the ending comes about, it's a little bit ambiguous. But I I think that it's set up so that you're led to believe that oh Leonardo got out of this jam and uh-huh. then the music is like dun 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 <laughs> and then he's going up the hill to the tate house you know like uh-huh. going, oh no run yeah. again yeah i was expecting like at the very end when he goes into the tate house to you know drink some mojitos <laughs> like <laughs> as one would the, right after you know, being you know using a flamethrower and stuff like that right like i was expecting like some more manson people to like you know come out like of the of bushes the shadows, and yeah. like follow them into the house because i'm like waiting for the murders to happen and they didn't well waiting for something to happen in the movie is that's my theme what is this movie about it's it's about almost being entertained (laughs) because it just was too long so here's the here when we saw it in the theater today there was a lot of high comedy around us i don't know if you caught on to that yeah grandpa was like watching netflix on his ipad no no or something no what happened was uh so grandpa wanted uh, so they have headphones in that theater that you can listen to the soundtrack or listen to the you know what's going on in the screen so you don't if you're hard of hearing and they have also the the ones that you can hold on a stick and it's got subtitles on it so this theater has that stuff so apparently the headphones that he was given and he was very hard of hearing and couldn't get around very well and his and his partner was kind of yelling at him um (laughs) and so the poor guy was wandering around the theater and anyway I noticed, so the, he went to take the headphones back because they were broken. They were just zapping. You could hear the fuzz. Yeah, yeah, you hear uh-huh. this, this, the squelch in them. Um, so he takes them back. He comes back. He gets in the wrong row, first yeah, of all, yeah, because it was that. pitch black. And mm-hmm. I felt bad for the guy. I was going to, you know, I was going to do what I did when you came in the theater and stand up and wave <laughs> at him. Um, but uh, so he gets in this, his seat. It's all settled. And this is just in the row in front of us, just over to the right a little bit. And uh, I noticed that the, I could hear, the headphones were cranked. He didn't have yeah. them on his head. I could hear. And the dialogue was from another movie. <laughs> so I don't know if he had the, on the wrong frequency, <laughs> wrong channel. So he puts, he puts the headphones on. And I'm looking up at the screen. And the screen is, there's no dialogue in the screen. He's got like the, the Lion King going on. And he's got ears. the Lion King going on. <laughs> and I'm thinking through the movie. And I feel bad for the poor guy. Like, I don't know if he ever took them off. But I'm thinking, that guy's probably having more fun than anybody in the theater. Who, by the way, the crowd was probably 75% 70 and over. Yeah, we were definitely which was the youngest people. Mystifying. Like, yeah. you're going to see a Quentin Tarantino movie and right. you're like, what are you thinking you're going to see? And then when all the blood and gore and everything, everybody was going, oh, oh, oh. Should, should we talk about the ending? Well, we shouldn't give away the ending in case somebody wants to see it. It's only the second day of release. People know what they're getting into when they go to a Tarantino movie. Like, they expect, they expect the gore. So... Yeah, yeah, it was really gory. <laughs> it was, was really. It was gory. supremely gory, and Holy not crap. just not just like uh, how do I how do I summarize this? Not just like ooh, that was gory, but ooh, that was gory, and let's do that same thing three times right. in a row. It was sustained gore. 
Yeah, for... Brad Pitt got some serious licks in. Yeah, he totally did. And I would just like to say that um, so Brad Pitt's dog in the movie is a pit bull. And she sustained, she did not sustain, she inflicted. She inflicted a lot of damage. A lot of damage. And I'm very kind of unhappy about that because breed specific legislation does nothing but serve to kill innocent dogs and pit bulls are not terrible dogs. So like it's nature, it's nurture, not nature. So I agree with that. Absolutely. And not just because, uh, we live in the same house, but, uh, (laughs) that is the real reason behind what you said earlier about stereotypes and problematic race, gender, also, species yeah so you're you're upset about the whole representation of dogs in this movie right yeah i mean yeah she only attacked when ordered to right so you know and who trained her to do that right her owner yeah so but yeah yeah, so that was definitely part of the uh sustained 10 minute long gore fest at the end of the movie (laughs) let me just say that i was very surprised that the flamethrower made a reappearance at the end of the movie and and did it ever i will say one thing that i did like about the movie was whenever they would do callbacks to like leo's career when it was on the upswing and it was like kind of absurd you know because it was like the 50s and the 60s when not leo's career itself the character right career. the character's yeah. career yeah because yeah, there is so. a lot of self-referential stuff yeah that's about hollywood yeah yeah so uh yeah i did i did enjoy the callbacks because they were they were kind of absurd it started pretty well like i yeah. liked that there was it was a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing and it was it was definitely uh a parody or at least a, a whimsical look at mm-hmm. Hollywood and the characters and, and television and all that sort of stuff. You don't see a lot of movies about early television, right? Like mm-hmm. you see quiz show and you see right. some other things like that that are extremes, but you don't see the, like the day to day, the the way that they punched out these shows in those mm-hmm. days, like many episodes in one year and, and they churned through them and, and character actors went from movie to movie or uh, show to show and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of material there. You don't see that. I saw a little bit of that at the beginning of the movie, and I was encouraged. And mm-hmm. like you said, it was Leonardo DiCaprio's character was was kind of you know full of himself, and then you could yeah. tell he was a little bit of a wild pistol. And, and mm-hmm. next thing you know, he's on the on the downswing. And I thought that he did a good job. And the other part about this too is that I noticed again, Tarantino seemed like he wanted to make a western. He wanted yeah. to make a. a a TV show, mm-hmm. and he wanted to make uh, a European movie. Like he, right. all these things he mashed into this movie, and that's why it's three hours long, <laughs> or maybe more. I can't remember. <laughs> I've never. This has been a long time since I've been in a movie that I dislike this much. Wow! So I, you like, wouldn't even give it a C. Uh, I would. I would give it an F for sure. Holy cow! Yeah, I was. Wow. There were p- points when I was in that movie, and I was looking at you, and I was like. I wonder if she'd be upset if I left. Oh, man. And I don't think I've ever left a movie. Yeah, I don't think I have either. It was, I just wasn't a fan of it. Okay. So, yeah. so wow, there you go. There you go, folks. Daltz There you go, listener. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, an F. I would like my money back from that movie. Well, good news, you only spent $4 on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks dollars. to a gift card that some uh, crazy hottie got me. Yeah. Who is she? I'll kill her. <laughs> Two dollars, technically, because it was... Two between the four. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. So. And the new theater that actually is upgraded and near us that might get stadium theater seating. Oh, whoops. Yeah, we, uh, we're we still waiting on the stadium seating in the booze. So, in the booze? <laughs> so, like, they've redone the concession area, which, like, I don't care about if there's no booze out there, so... I think we probably could sneak booze into that one. Yeah. I don't the, think they would care all that much. Yeah, the 16-year-olds are not Johnny on the spot when well, it comes to... And plus they have that self-check-in thing. You oh, know, you go true. over there and check in and you could have like, you know, like a box of cigars in your pocket and they won't even care. Yeah, And true. then you just go in and smoke them in the theater. Nobody complain. Yeah. It's New England. Nobody really says anything about anything. <laughs> How long have you lived here? <laughs> Too long. <laughs> So final thoughts on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Final thoughts on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go see another Quentin Tarantino movie. Well, allegedly he's only making one more, right? Because he said he wanted to make 10. And this is like number nine. Was that number nine? Really? I think so. Yeah. Well, not a moment too soon. Huh. (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah. Final, my final thoughts. uh, I'd say go see uh, Captain Marvel again or go see wow. Avengers, uh, and the multi-sequel again. And our listener knows that Daltz does not like superhero movies. Well, so. here's, what's, here's also what I thought as I'm sitting there waiting for something to happen. I'm thinking, am I so conditioned by superhero movies that I don't, 
that I have an expectation something should be going on every minute of the of the screen time. <laughs> See, this is why when we went to Vermont back in May, I was like, we need to be doing stuff. What are we doing? Because every day in my life is scheduled down to the minute. And then when I don't have anything to do, I'm like, I feel like I'm not being productive. Right. So that's you now with movies. Now this that is me I've, with movies. I've taken you to so many Marvel movies. This is what you've done to me. So we should have gone to see Spider-Man instead. We Oh, we should have. <laughs> we should have. Maybe also my... Uh, I've been watching Magnum P.I. a lot lately, the oh, original yeah. Magnum P.I. So maybe that's maybe that's changed my judgment as well. Maybe I'm waiting for... TC to come in with a chopper and... <laughs> yeah, save the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my other right is your mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And, and so note. even even some like witty TC Magnum Rick banter would have been good. There was none of that in this movie. There wasn't even any dialogue. Like Quentin Tarantino is supposed to be the king of dialogue. So I, I didn't see any of that. I will admit I there was a lot made of the fact that Margot Robbie did not have many lines. And so I was expecting her to die much earlier in the movie because she, she did have a few lines. She had more lines than I thought. When you yeah. said that to me and then I was paying attention to the movie and mm. she had more, she, I think she had more lines than Brad Pitt. Like they, <laughs> he, Leonardo DiCaprio had a lot of lines. Yeah. Brad Pitt didn't have a lot of lines in this movie. Yeah. But I don't know that he needed many lines for the character. Cause you just thought he was eye candy. That's all. Well, I mean, he he was very lean in this movie. Yeah, he looked a little he, skinny. He was very lean in this movie. Yeah. And honestly, Leo looked good in this movie too. Like normally, Leo kind of has like the middle aged alcohol bloat going on, but he leaned out. He was a little puffy. Well, at the end, he was really puffy after he allegedly went to Rome and gained fifteen pounds from eating <laughs> on the pasta. Eating but the but, delicious but, pasta. but he was puffier than Brad, and I was just like. Would Brad really be his stunt double in real life? Because their body types are not especially similar at these weights. So there you go. I am body shaming males in Hollywood. Turn about his fair play. Wow. I never would have expected that. That is a, that's a huge moment in the podcast right there. People who are listening, listener, bookmark that, that moment. Episode 37, Coco body shame somebody. Cut, cut that segment out and put it on YouTube and play it over and over again. Um, holy moly. It was funny, though, like every time Brad was dolled up as the actual stunt double, like he had like all the pieces to get his hairline to right. be similar yeah. to, to Leo's. And it was so funny to watch him like take his weave off to go kick Bruce Lee's ass. Like it was <laughs> really funny. And that whole scene, too, was like that felt very superfluous to me. I I enjoyed it. You liked and, it? Yeah. And, and then I felt bad about myself because I'm like, this is more Make Hollywood Great Again where the white guy is kicking right. the Asian guy's ass. Right. But it was so funny, you know. I, like, I, see, I didn't mind this, like, the comeuppance part of it. Yeah. But does, was Bruce Lee really like that? I mean, right. like, I, I don't, don't know, know anything about Bruce Lee. I, right. I, I thought he was pretty well regarded in Hollywood. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's a guy who was an Asian star in the 80s. I mean, how difficult must that have been? Right. Uh-huh. And, uh... And was a very smart guy, from what I understand. I mean, I don't, again, I don't yeah, know a lot no. about him. And there hasn't been, you know, a lot done on Bruce Lee in, in recent years. But um, I, I just thought that was kind of like, I didn't realize, I didn't know why that was there. I mean, to make Brad Pitt look good and, and mm-hmm. look tough. But then there's the whole unresolved issue about his wife. Yeah, that and yeah, there was there was a lot of threads that were dangling in this movie that mm-hmm. didn't, it didn't. But then I felt like. Together. Tarantino deliberately left it vague as to whether the death of Brad's wife was accidental or deliberate. Right. Because if we know oh, that he I, deliberately killed his wife. No, right? I don't mean yeah, it yeah. that way. I, oh, okay. I, I appreciate the ambiguity yeah. there. Uh-huh. I was more like, why didn't we touch on that a little bit more in the oh, movie? Okay. And, and, yeah, yeah. And uh-huh. Brad Pitt only remembered it the one time in the movie. Right. Only flashed back. And mm-hmm. it was actually a very interesting flashback, the way he was sitting and she was nagging on him and stuff like yeah. that. It was very... That was okay. It just it was... If you'd have been married to somebody and they, you shot them accidentally and they died in your presence, you think that would play with your mind a little bit? I maybe that's why he was so beaten down and broken. That could be. Yeah. And maybe, again, I'm watching too many Magnum uh, episodes where he's doing flashbacks to Nam. <laughs> so maybe I just... <laughs> this isn't Nam. This is bowling. There are rules. <laughs> there you go with the Big Lebowski The Big Lebowski quote. reference. Yeah. And with that... Oh, so... <laughs> What did you think? Final words on on this movie now that I've hogged the uh, the attention on this one. No, like I said, I I I liked it. I didn't love it. Yeah, yeah. It was 
it was problematic. I wish more had kind of happened because it wasn't. <laughs> you wish you mean it had been entertaining? Well, because it, it wasn't even really a character study because there no. wasn't any, there wasn't enough depth. There wasn't enough depth. And Leonardo DiCaprio's character was was deep. I thought that was the deepest of all the characters, and he was the center point of he was the pinnacle of the movie. So I can I could go with that, but everybody else was just cardboard. Yeah. So I it. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but that's probably because I didn't really know a whole lot about it going in, except for the fact that it's allegedly about the Sharon Tate murder. Which, but is it really? But it really isn't, and it managed to make the very famous murder of a woman be all about men. So. And uh, <laughs> I think there's about three or four movies in there. Yeah. And that's the problem. I, I think it should that. have been one movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, so the band is playing us out. So we've got to go. <laughs> okay. So uh, for another week of the podcast, thanks for joining us for this special uh, summer edition as the air conditioning hopefully will kick on for the next session. For another week of the podcast, I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dodds. <laughs>